evening, everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us. My name is Eric Glazer. I run Physician Engagement and Social Media here at Best Doctors, and you have joined our latest installment called Case Studies in Diagnostic Errors. Tonight's topic is difficulties in diagnosing headaches. It will be moderated by Dr. Martin Samuels. He's the chairman of neurology at the department uh, in the Department of Neurology at the Brigham Women's Hospital and is also a professor at Harvard Medical School. He's brought together an esteemed panel of specialists, and they're going to discuss challenges around uh, diagnosing headaches, specifically talking about mistakes in determining when to be concerned about possible subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, mistakes in assuming that a headache is a brain tumor when it's an ordinary migraine, and incidental findings as a result of excess imaging. Last week, I had the privilege of attending a conference down in Washington, D.C. called TEDMED, and one of the my favorite quotes that I heard from one of the presenters down there was, average people who work well together always beat brilliant people who don't work well together. And at Best Doctors, we like to think that we take the best sides of that equation and bring them together, bringing together brilliant people and facilitating a process that enables them to work really well together. And there are three important things that I'd like you to uh, know about Best Doctors as a byproduct of tonight's session, if you don't already. One is that we provide comprehensive uh, second opinions for physicians and their patients. And we do that by facilitating a collaborative process that brings together the treating physician with some of the best experts around the country to collaborate virtually uh, in a, a fairly unique process. At Best Doctors, we have our own clinical team of nurses and internal physicians that help with both the medical record uh, collection and synthesis of the case and through that process and some online technology, we're able to facilitate a very easy, uh, collaborative way of looking at uh, complex cases. The second thing I'd like you to know is if you've been elected a best doctor, and we, we elect our best doctors through an impartial Gallup poll where we ask all of you across the country who are the most respected thought, respected thought leaders in your specialty. And we, we actually not take a database and collect these best doctors and bring them into our cases. And if you're like, if you are a best doctor, we'd love to consult with you. We'd love to get you on our cases. We pay honorariums to participate in our process. So what we're going to do at the end of tonight's session, which is 45 minutes long, incidentally, we're going to ask you if you want to get involved in our cases. And you'll be able to click on a button and say yes, and we'll follow up and send you some more information. The third thing I'd like you to know is often now we're receiving requests from treating physicians who re receive our reports, the output of our process, and say, geez, how could, I, how could I get access to your service for more of my patients? This is great. Well, our, our service is typically funded by the patient's employer or health carrier. So it's not necessarily a benefit that all of your patients may have. Well, we're running a pilot for a short amount of time with the Medical Group Management Association that could allow you to offer our consultation services or access our consultation services for no charge to you or your patient. Uh, so if you want more information on how that works, how you can be part of that, you could certainly, again, raise your hand through this survey that we're going to put up right around the 40-minute mark of tonight's session, and you could request more information. We'll be happy to get it to you. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Samuels to introduce the panel. I'm going to put up our disclosure statement, which, of course, the ACCME requires us to do while Dr. Samuels is introducing the panel. Uh, Marty, I'll pass over the presenter controls to you in a moment, and it's all yours. Eric, thanks very much. It's great to, um, great to be here. I uh, am delighted to uh, chair this session. Uh, headache is obviously one of the biggest problems in all of medicine. And uh, if you uh, look at polls that have been taken among family doctors, emergency physicians, primary care people, headache really is among the top five complaints for which people seek attention in the doctor's office. And, uh, of course, these are very worrisome complaints. They can, uh, they can reflect serious underlying disease, although most uh, people with headache have a fairly benign uh, condition. So what we're going to do today, uh, which is uh, analogous to the other sessions that we've had in our series, is to present some of our own error cases to use as a uh, focus for discussion around this extremely uh, common problem. Let me start by introducing our panel, and then I'll start by uh, presenting my first case, and then we'll work around our panel. So uh, Lakshmi Nayak is um, instructor in neurology at Harvard Medical School, as well as 
a neuro-oncologist at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Her clinical interests include uh, primary brain and spinal cord tumors, brain and leptomeningeal metastases, and neurological complications of cancer. Edgar Ross is the director uh, for Pain Management Center and the assistant and assistant professor of anesthesiology and pain management uh, at Harvard Medical School. He's widely recognized as one of the leading experts in paid management and is involved in efforts to use the Internet as a tool in disease management. And our third member of our panel is Glenn Solomon. Glenn is a professor and chair of the Department of Internal Medicine at Wright State uh, Medical School in Dayton, Ohio. His uh, specialty expertise is headache medicine, and he's authored over 100 peer-reviewed papers, 35 book chapters, and two textbooks on this uh, subject. So welcome, all of you, and thanks very much for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, let me start with a case of my own. This is a very memorable case, one of these things that I'll never forget, and uh, I want to in- encourage the other members of our panel to in- to uh, become involved in this discussion. By the way, uh, for the sake of those who are listening to us, um, none of the panelists have ever heard about this case uh, before, so this is, uh, this is cold for all of them. So this is a 61-year-old guy who had headaches in the past, but uh, over the past three months he's developed a new type of right-sided head, head pain. Uh, he had had a, a right-sided vestibular schwannoma successfully resected five years previously, um, it was done by a neurosurgeon, a very distinguished neurosurgeon, and an uh, otorhinolaryngologic surgeon. They operated together. They uh, removed the tumor, they thought, completely, and they left a little bit of metal mesh, which you'll, you'll hear in a moment is quite important, um, behind the ear where they had done their uh, surgery. Here uh, is the scan of the patient. He called the, um, uh, called the neurosurgeon and said, you know, I'm having a new kind of headache. The neurosurgeon was very world worried that it had something to do with um, his surgery, so he uh, ordered a CT scan. Now, the reason the CT scan was done here was that uh, he couldn't have an MR because, as you can see here, uh, if you look at the bottom left of this uh, photograph, and this is, a, this is an MR, uh, pardon me, this is a CT scan, you can see that there's mesh, metal mesh, uh, which they had put in here at this retro... Uh, oral incision, and uh, so they couldn't get a uh, an MRI. The uh, neurosurgeon uh, looked at the scan, didn't find anything wrong with his surgery, and was very concerned about this new headache. So he actually called me, and uh, I said, "Why don't you come over and let's talk to the patient right this minute?" So that the neurosurgeon came to my office with this patient, and um, I said to him, "You know, let's take a history." So here's the history. These head pains occurred in distinct attacks. They lasted about 20 minutes each. They were always centered around the right eye. They were not associated with any ptosis or pupillary abnormalities or change in conjunctival or scleral color or nasal stuffiness. The guy had tried over-the-counter NSAIDs. They didn't work. His wife had some uh, triptans in the house. He tried them, and they didn't work, and that's when he called the uh, neurosurgeon. So I wonder what uh, what all of you think this uh, diagnosis is, and I wonder if our experts would want to chime in at this point. Uh, any of you willing to say what you think this uh, diagnosis is? Hi, Marty. Um, this is Lakshmi. I, Lakshmi, go ahead. So, um, it sounds very like a cluster headache, although um, I, you know, the point that you made about not having all of the autonomic phenomenon. Um, makes it maybe unlikely, but that's something that I would consider definitely. Yeah. How about what do you think, Glenn? What, what would your diagnosis be of this thing? Twenty-minute episodes of uh, eye pain. That'll be thinking about things like chronic paroxysmal hemicrania, one of the hemicranial disorders with a short duration headache that's purely unilateral. Problem with this patient is, who? Well, at least we agreed on that. <laughs> the one thing I would worry about is the fact that he's got mesh, and I would worry about, you know, any patient, um, the risk of infection just because he's got hardware in his head. Right. Um, so I uh, I sat there. You can, imagine the, the, you can imagine the scene here. The neurosurgeon and I and the patient were all sitting together. I took this history, and I said to him, you know what, this is chronic paroxysmal hemicrania. 
uh, and I prescribed indomethacin at a dose of 50 milligrams IM. And in fact, I told the uh, um, I told the uh, uh, neurosurgeon that I was confident that this would respond to indomethacin, and I even lectured him a little bit about it and said, "Oh, you know, this is indomethacin responsive headache, and you're going to see this guy does very well." The neurosurgeon was was extremely uh, thankful. He said, thank goodness this is not my surgery. And you can see I said in this slide he actually kissed my feet, which is a very unusual thing <laughs> for a neurosurgeon with regard to a neurologist. Um, and uh, I treated the guy, and he was, he was remarkably improved. But a month later, he called to say that he had awakened with a black eye, at which point I said, you better come to the emergency department immediately because I think this proves that I was right, and this is definitely hemicrania. So the guy arrived in the emergency department, and I want to show you what it looked like, because I took a picture with my, with my um, cell phone. So here's a picture of the guy from the side. Here he is from the front. And you can see that he does have a black eye. And, in fact, not only does he have a black eye, but you can see it's already resolving a little bit because it's sort of yellowish-green. And so here was the scene. We were in the emergency department. The guy was, we were surrounded by the emergency physicians. The neurosurgeon was there. Everybody was very worried. And I said, well, this is absolute proof that this is hemicrania because you all probably don't know, but um, these headaches are neurovascular, and they're really neurogenic inflammation. And uh, all of you must have, uh, you know, learned that migraine was vasodilation and vasoconstriction, but actually nowadays we know better and I said, you know what, not only that, I'm going to send you a paper <laughs> that proves that I'm right about this. And I sent them this paper. Look at this paper. This is a paper from 1898 <laughs> of a guy who every time he got a headache, he would get a black eye, which is pretty impressive, huh, if you see here. And I said, this is proof that it's neurogenic inflammation. So the neurosur these uh, emergency physicians were extremely impressed by this uh, idea. They, were, they couldn't get over it. Um, they said, my goodness, I can't believe that you know these things. It's a miracle. And I said, of course, you know, this is why we have neurologists. We know these things. It's very unusual. And I said, we're going to just double the endomethacin, and the guy's going to be perfectly all right. Any comments by anybody? Now, Kelly has a little question that I sent out, um, a, a question with some uh, with um, some uh, multiple choice answers, and I think this is the time to put that on there. So the question is, episodic crania is always a primary headache syndrome, usually responds to ibuprofen and naproxen, may be a primary or secondary headache syndrome, is synonymous with Horton's cluster headache, is synonymous with short-lasting unilateral neuralgia form headache with conjunctival injection and tearing, the so-called sunk syndrome. So I'd like everybody who's listening in on this to, to, uh, to vote on this, and then we'll finish the case. I'm not going to ask the experts here to uh, comment on this right at this moment because they're going to have, obviously have opinion about it, and I'd like to make sure that, the, uh, that everybody listening in has a chance to, um, has a chance to vote on this, there, there, so there it is. So I think everybody has has voted. Uh, so at this point, I sent the guy home on double the dose of uh, indomethacin, and as I as I said here, an inspector calls. Inspector calls is the name of a of a wonderful English drawing room drama, uh, in which a very clever inspector at the last minute figures out the uh, correct diagnosis. It's uh, um, uh, it's uh, like Colombo. In fact, I think it was probably the origin of the idea of Colombo. In any case, a month later, somebody who's doing a teaching conference with the uh, residents in radiology says to the residents, who has the patient with the nasopharyngeal cancer? And they say, well, we don't have a patient with nasopharyngeal cancer. And he said, yes, you do. And look at this picture. This is the same image I showed you just a moment ago. But now I've outlined a giant mass in the nasopharynx, completely obliterating the, the eustachian tube, which you can see in black on the other side. This is the identical picture. Uh, don't feel badly because I've shown this to, I think, hundreds of experts, and nobody other, other than a radiologist ever sees that mass. In any case, the radiologist uh, called the patient, if you can believe this, told him that a mass was missed, told him to come back to the emergency department, 
He comes back to the emergency department. I feel horrible about this. I call an otorhinolaryngologist, a friend of mine, who says, yes, there's a horrible mass in this guy's neck. Um, what are the lessons that, that one can learn from this case? Um, let me ask my other experts here. I mean, what do you learn from this case? Here I call this a paroxysmal hemicrania. It was indomethacin responsive. A mass was found in his throat. What, what do you take away from that? I'll tell you what I took away. I, <laughs> I took away from, from this the fact that I was overconfident. I felt very confident that this was a primary headache syndrome. I didn't think that it could be secondary. I, didn't, I was not very good at reason, reading CT scans of the base of the skull. I'm good at the brain, but I'm not very good at the soft tissue, and I missed it. Um, let me finish this now. Do you think the case is over? Well, it turns yeah. out that the biopsy of this mass was not a cancer of the nasopharynx, but it was a piece. It was, a, it was granulomatous vasculitis with aseptic necrosis. At which point, we called in a rheumatologist, and the rheumatologist, in about one microsecond, said, "Why don't you get a chest CT scan, which shows lesions in the chest, and why don't you get one blood test, which was a C anca, which was positive." So, in fact, this was a case of granulomatous arteritis, Wegner's granulomatosis. It used to be called lethal midline granuloma in the old days, um, which presented with a syndrome that looked like hemicrania and even was, um, even was endomethacin responsive. And here it is a month later after treatment with cyclophosphamide, and you can see the mass is gone. The eustachian tube is now completely visible on the affected side. So... So, to me, this was a case, uh, almost, uh, almost a double whammy on this case. I, uh, I thought it was a primary headache syndrome. I felt that, uh, that, the, that the response to endomethacin proved it. I was wrong. And then I believed that it was a cancer because a radiologist told me it was a cancer, when in fact the biopsy showed that it was granulomatous arteritis. And I have to tell you, this guy now, several years later, has been treated by the rheumatologist and is doing extremely, extremely well. So I learned uh, a lot uh, from this case. Any, any comments from any of our panel of experts before we go, out to, go on to Lakshmi's case? My first question is, did his headaches stay away without the endomethacin? Yes, they did. Okay, so just it's a treating him with cyclophosphamide for his Wegener's was enough to manage his headaches. So in other words... Uh, this was a secondary headache I mean, that I had misconstrued as a primary headache, and um, it produced it produced a syndrome which was exactly to me like hemicrania, and even endomethacin responsive. And yet it was it was obviously caused by this mass because once the mass was cured, the whole syndrome disappeared. I guess if I were going to make one other teaching point just for the audience, um, the places where I think I have been most burned in my career with making diagnostic errors have been in this kind of case. It's the unusual headache case. It's the uh, purely unilateral headache. It's, it's the cluster patient. It's the um, in the methicin responsive headache patient. And I think that group of patients um, is probably the one group where I would most commonly say even though I think this is a primary headache disorder, this is the group where I am much more inclined to image them uh, just to be on the safe side. Yeah. Uh, because this is the group where, where I have just found in my career that I've ma had the most secondary causes of what look for all the world like primary headache disorders. Yeah, it's a frightening thing, isn't it, uh, this kind of case. Um, Glenn, that's a very, very important point. Lakshmi, would you like to uh, take over and... Uh, present your first case. Sure. Thanks, Martin. Um, so this is a patient um, that I treated um, last year. She's a, she was a 44-year-old woman who presented initially to an outside hospital with headaches and had a head CT and then brain imaging uh, and was found to have this left-sided uh, frontotemporal lesion, which was resected. The pathology was glioblastoma she received the standard therapy for this tumor, which is radiation and temozolomide. 
um, which is a chemotherapy. During radiation, she had a lot of trouble with headaches, and she required um, Decadron, which we use several times during radiation therapy to counteract the edema from the tumor and the radiation. And it was very difficult to wean off the Decadron. Additionally, she was also using oxycodone for her headaches. Um, she refused to get adjuvant chemotherapy, which is also standard after the radiation, and we were just following her with serial imaging. Um, she was doing fine for the next several months with occasional headaches, um, nothing spectacular. She had relief with um, intermittent oxycodone and sometimes required decadron as well, but not for a prolonged period of time. About nine months into the diagnosis, when I actually expected her to progress, especially because she had not been on chemotherapy, she developed um, worsening headaches, similar headaches to what she had before, um, as well as blurry vision. And then um, a f about a week into the headaches, she had a seizure. So she was admitted to an emergency room. We had an MRI that was sent to me. I saw her in clinic myself, by which time she had recovered. She still had the headaches, but the MRI looked stable in terms of her tumor. So um, I sent her home. She didn't want to, you know, do any more chemo. It seemed appropriate. And about a month after this, um, she continued to have worsening headaches. Now was being a little bit lethargic and presented um, with generalized tonic-clonic seizures to an outside hospital. There was a delay in obtaining images from the hospital to ours. Eventually, after a week of worsening headaches, lethargy, and more seizures, I had her transferred over to the Brigham and Women's Hospital, where when I saw her and got a head CT, which you can see showed enlarged ventricles. So um, she was emergently taken for a VT shunt placement, and she recovered in terms of her lethargy, um, woke up, was not having any more headaches, was not having any more seizures. At that time, I was thinking, well, why did she suddenly develop hydrocephalus but didn't look into it further on other than getting an MRI of her brain? A week later... Um, she became paraplegic, and um, if you look, if um, Kelly can show the next scan, um, not this one actually, but the, she basically ended up having um, multiple drop metastases in her spine, huh. which was probably the reason for the hydrocephalus and, um, and this the headache. And this was she. This was GBM, right? Uh, yes. Last thing? Yeah, and it's not un it's not usual for GBM to go to the spine, and it's extremely rare. And I think for me, the biggest problem was that you know this was a woman who had had headaches at her presentation, so I was thinking only in terms of the focal tumor and not beyond it. And a lot of our patients with brain tumors have headaches, and once they have headaches, they are sometimes difficult to control. Um, and I wasn't thinking that she would, you know, have hydrocephalus like right. this. I do, you know, when I look back, I have actually looked at her um, fundi at the time that she had come in with worsening headaches initially, um, and she didn't have papilledema at the time. But I guess that was the initial onset of everything. So um, for me, uh, you know, the takeaway point from this case was that, you know, even in patients with brain tumors who have known headaches, if there's a change or worsening of headaches, I guess that requires thorough investigation um, to look for other causes additionally. Thanks. Thanks. That's a that's a very interesting point. I want to ask our two other uh, panelists about this because I've actually always had a little trouble understanding about the origin of headache in uh, these uh, parenchymal brain tumors like GBM. 
So, so uh, uh, short of hydrocephalus or a big uh, mass, I mean, why do these people get headaches? What is the uh, because most of the brain is not very uh, uh, richly innervated by small fibers, pain fibers. What do you think, uh, either Glenn or Ed? What is your view about that? What causes headaches in these patients? Well, in the tumor headaches, um, headaches second are related to tumor. Um, the traction on the meninges, uh, they, the, the meninges themselves are fairly richly innervated. Um, also, one wonders if there isn't some changes in the muscle tension, um, both in the back of the head, the neck, um, as well as across the, the forehead, which can certainly be painful as well. I mean, do you think hydrocephalus itself causes uh, causes head pain? Uh, uh, I think that's Ed speaking. Yes, I think well, I think hydrocephalus can cause head pain, but it has uh, um, it depends on how fast it develops. Um, so slowly developing is probably less likely. Yeah. Say, Glenn, uh, could we could we move on to the next one and have you present a case? Sure. Um, the case that I want to present actually is, is, was more of a, of a diagnostic dilemma that was sent to me. And this was uh, a, an older woman, a 76-year-old woman who came to see me uh, because she was having more frequent migraine auras. And she had had aura since the age of 14, and they really had not changed at all. Um, what she described was that her headaches always felt like or always looked like she was looking through a screen, and they were always visual. They would last for just a few minutes and would typically go away and be followed by a headache. As she got older, after menopause, she found that she was just getting the auras and really wasn't getting the headaches with them. And she had had some surgery and had sort of a flurry of getting more auras. And she came to see me because she was getting this flurry of auras and was wondering, um, does she need to be treated? Did she really need to do anything for these auras? She was getting uh, several a week. And her examination really was, was quite benign. And um, she had been worked up by her primary care doctor with a normal sedimentation rate. Uh, she had had uh, a CAT scan, which was normal. Um, and really my feeling was this was simply migraine aura without headache. And because the auras were really identical to what she had always had, and really were unchanged for some 62 years, I really felt very comfortable with that diagnosis and reassured her, told her she didn't need any therapy uh, and really never needed to see me again. Uh, so I was quite surprised when a month later she was back in my office. And now her story was that in the preceding two weeks she had been to the emergency room and had been admitted to the hospital because she had an episode of dysarthria, right hand clumsiness, and left leg weakness. That, and that event lasted for approximately an hour. She wasn't quite sure exactly how long. And it was followed by a severe headache. The doctors did an MRI, and I should make the point this woman had a history of TIAs and strokes in the past. Um, and the doctors said the MRI the, the next day was normal, so this was what they called a neurologic migraine, and that she should come back and see her headache doctor. And so the question that really came up for me is, how do you make the decision of is this an aura, or is this more likely a vascular event, a lacunar infarct or a TIA that was also associated with a bad headache. And this is where, you know, I felt very strongly that her new event was not an aura and that this was not migraine. 
And I just want to sort of go through my reasoning and why I chose to disagree with my neurologic colleagues on this one. First point was that this lady had the same aura that hadn't changed in 62 years. And up until a week before, her auras were always visual. She had never had uh, motor symptoms. She had never had sensory symptoms with her auras. Uh, the second point is that there are certain sort of classic findings that we see in auras that her past auras met pretty well. And there are really sort of three findings that, to me, distinguish an aura from a non-aura neurologic event. One is that auras are, are typically dynamic. They change over time. So if somebody has a blind spot, it's not a fixed blind spot, but rather it tends to grow or move or shift over the 20 minutes of an aura. So they tend to be very dynamic. Uh, if someone has a sensory aura, it usually moves from uh, distal to proximal, but it's really just a fixed neurologic finding. The second thing is that auras typically have both positive and negative phenomena. So if you have a blind spot, you typically have fortification spectra or you have scintillation that surrounds it. So you usually have something that is both positive as well as negative. If you have sensory phenomena, you typically have numbness with paresthesias. So they have tingling and they have numbness rather than just numbness alone. And thirdly is the point about the sensory symptoms in migraines tend to start out proximal and work distal. So people will say I get numbness and tingling in my fingers and my hands, and then they work up my arm. And so when I listened to her symptoms, they didn't fit with those criteria for aura. And so that made me think this was probably not aura and was probably more of a neurologic symptom. As it turns out, she has a PFO. I don't know if that's related to any of this or not. Um, but my feeling was we needed to treat her more as a TIA and not consider her neurologic symptoms to be aura. I think also, Glenn, the, one of the things about your case, if I heard you present it correctly, was there were, there were crossed symptoms. There was yes. right-sided facial left body, right? So that would be very unusual for migraine. And uh, obviously sounds like a brainstem event of some sort. And, you know, I think one of the things to remind everybody listening is that if you've got the genes for migraine, um, almost anything can stimulate a migraine-like event, uh, but it doesn't mean that it's a benign migraine. So I think that Glenn's point here that this was a, this was a different thing. There were cross findings that uh, didn't have the positive quality of a migraine really would raise your suspicion that, uh, that she was having a brainstem event and that uh, the migranous aspect of it was her genetic predisposition. She was a migranous, that's for sure, but uh, that this particular event probably wasn't one of those typical migraines. So it does have a lot of red flags, doesn't it, and her age and a lot of things about it. Did you ever figure out what this was? I, I've attributed this to uh, probably a TIA Maybe it's always hard to know when someone has a PFO if there's any relation or not. Yeah, right. Uh, but uh, we did anticoagulate her. Yeah, and our treatment. Yeah, the whole system. story of PFO and migraine is such an interesting story. The uh, the fact that uh, if you close a PFO, you will improve migraine, but what the mechanism is whereby PFOs aggravate migraine is really you know sort of unknown. It's some, something something presumably in the blood that gets onto the from the right side to the left side of the circulation that uh, precipitates a migranous episode in a, in a person with, a, with the right genetic predisposition. Um, before we run short of time, I wanted Ed to uh, present us one of his. Ed, you got a case? I do, and um, this is a case of a patient that I saw many, many years ago early in my career. Um, and it's taught me uh, essentially you know, with the, some of the problems of being a chronic pain management doctor, um, and sort of relying on everyone else um, to make the diagnosis and treat. So this was, was a 67-year-old woman who was referred to me after she had been to several headache doctors, 
um, with uh, continued muscle tension and uh, uh, type of picture. Um, she was very nice. Um, there was certainly concerns about medication overuse headache and rebound headache. And uh, with using our interdisciplinary team, we set off to try to wean her off some of the um, medications, particularly over-counter caffeine uh, uh, containing medications to uh, uh, reduce and can re eliminate her, what we thought were rebound headaches. So a couple months went by, she had been seen by the staff, she had uh, participated in, um, our, with our psychologist and using all the alternative medicine techniques that um, often work. And she was not improving. So, um, and this is a woman who's had the headaches for an extremely long time. So I sat down with her and actually uh, went through all the symptoms again um, and found really nothing out of the ordinary. And in passing, she also she mentioned to me, we were just about ready, done with the visit, that um, she sometimes doesn't know where she is. Um, and it seems like uh, an hour or two could go by that she just um, has no recollection of and what she was doing in that period of time. And um, so at that point, um, back in the career, I got a, a CAT scan, um, pleaded with the uh, radiologist that this needed to be done fairly quickly, and it came back um, that this was a very large meningioma. Um, she still, she obviously had headaches for decades before, so meningioma wasn't the cause of the headache. However, um, again, as in chronic pain, um, I always have to be open to trying to figure out another symptom that may explain that there may be underlying pathology. So let me ask you, do you think, this is, brings up an interesting question, I mean, do you think there is such a thing as an epileptic headache or an epileptic migraine? In other words, these episodes where she didn't know where she was, presumably these were seizures. And do you think, do you think that headache can be a major uh, manifestation of, uh, uh, of seizure? I, I mean, I'd, I'd leave that to you and to the neurologists on the panel to answer that question. Um, but my takeaway here is that you know, chronic pain patients have at times real problems. And even if they've been through the whole diagnostic tree, um, you still have to be on your toes and, and be very careful. Yeah, I think it's it's a very important point. It brings up a lot of important, uh, very interesting questions. And uh, one of the things that I always worry about in um, in imaging patients is the incidentaloma problem. So, you know, obviously headache is an extremely common problem. I mean, some people would say it's universal, that virtually every human being um, has headaches. That means if we went down to Fenway Park tonight and we got a, uh, scan on every single person in Fenway Park, how many meningiomas would we find? And are those meningiomas actually correlated with any symptom at all, or are we just using headache as a way of uh, generating images, which then, uh, you know, demonstrate these incidental findings? I mean, this was a big meningioma. Ed, you felt pr pretty confident that this thing was causing headaches? Well, it was a fairly good-sized meningioma. Um, neurosurgery uh, admitted her urgently and um, started her on, um, you know, the steroids first and took her to surgery fairly quickly there afterwards. Yeah. Um, me, what do you think? Uh, sorry, go ahead, Ed. Finish, finish your And, and post-surgery, her headaches improved dramatically. All right. Well, that's so, important. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a very important uh, part of the argument. I mean, Lakshmi, what do you think about uh, the relationship between meningiomas and uh, and headache? What's your, I mean, what, not only what do you think, but what are what do the data show about this? So, in general, I mean, it's a very interesting question. You know, um, about 40 to 50 percent of primary brain tumor patients present with headaches, and they there are some studies which have shown that even up to about 70% to develop headaches at some point during the course of their disease. Um, they feel that the primary brain tumors are more common to have headaches rather than, you know, secondary brain tumors or METs. So primary brain tumors would include meningiomas, and meningiomas account for about 33% of all primary brain tumors. 
So that's a fair number. Having said that, um, I think I agree with you in the sense that, you know, a lot of times we find a tiny meningioma, which is, you know, a subsonometer, not causing any mass effect or anything, and a patient has had a headache for a while or had a fall, and which is what led to, uh, you know, a head CT, which showed this lesion. And I'm not quite convinced that the headaches are because of the meningioma, because unlike in Edgar's case, a lot of these people, when they have their meningiomas resected, they still have the headaches. Right. I must say that, uh, you know, if you think about what, you know, what is innervated with small fibers inside the skull, basically the summary statement is it's the dura and anything near the dura that really is, that is uh, sensitive for nociception. So right. to me, meningioma is a, is a tumor that certainly could produce headache, whereas glioma, um, until it becomes so large that it's distorting meningeal structures, as, as Ed said a minute ago, hard for me to understand why it would cause headache at all. And I, certainly many people who we see who have very large glioblastomas who are aphasic and hemiplegic and demented and all the rest don't have headache at all. And uh, on the other side of the coin, I mean, a headache is so common that to try to say that headache is, associ- is, is caused by these tumors, not so easy to, uh, to, always, uh, to always make that correlation. And certainly patients, of course, are very worried about brain tumor one of the main things that I have to reassure people about when I see them for headache that I can recognize as an ordinary migraine, uh, people are worried about it. And uh, the question is, you know, how certain can we be without imaging that the uh, headache is not caused by the brain tum- uh, by a brain tumor of some sort? So it's actually a very important question uh, and, um, and one which I, th- I think we haven't, you know, we haven't completely resolved with the data we currently have. Um, sadly, we're running out of time. It's, a, it's a 45 minutes coming up in, in just about a minute, and I'm going to have to turn it back to Eric um, to sort of close this session. I want to thank uh, Lakshmi Nayak, who is a neuro-oncologist at the Farber in Boston, Edgar Ross, who is a, uh, who is a director of the Pain Management Center uh, in the Department of Anesthesiology at the Brigham, and Glenn Solomon is professor and chair of the Department of Medicine at Wright State for uh, contributing their own cases, which is very courageous. I think uh, contributing your own mistakes is a very courageous uh, act. I, I thank you all for doing that. And uh, I turn it back to uh, Eric to close the session for the evening. Thank you. Yeah, I want to echo my gratitude to our entire panel. This was terrific. Uh, the time flew. It was a terrific session. Dr. Samuels, thank you very much, uh, as usual, for a, a terrific job. I want to remind everyone uh, that this quick uh, survey that's in front of you will take all but two or three minutes to complete if you haven't already, and it will allow you an opportunity to request more information uh, and give us some feedback. And that information that uh, you could request uh, to reiterate some of my points at the beginning of today's session was, one, if you want to consult on our cases, you're interested in getting involved in that collaborative process, we'd love to hear from you. And two, if you're interested in that pilot and how to access best doctor service and collaborate with our network of experts. We'd love to get you, uh, have you join that pilot and be part of that process as well. So you can request information. And, and certainly if you want to earn the three-quarter uh, credit of CME, uh, you can do that by, by clicking on a button on the survey. So this will mark the end of the session. We're, we're right about on time. Thank you all to our panelists and Dr. Samuels again. And we'll see you next month on our next, uh, our next installment of Case Studies and Diagnostic Error. Thank you very much. 